never forget that night as long as I live. I went to UT Hospital, went back in the room, and there was Betty and this beautiful little boy, just blue as he could be, and had him lying on the outside there. I went back there and prayed with him. A little casket about that long. We carried it over here, this graveyard right behind us. We carried it over there and buried it in what they call baby land. And now just a few weeks ago, Bill lost his wife, Betty. So he's lost his son, he's lost his wife, Betty. Bill Wright, he came up here to teach in our school, and he taught in the Bible Institute. He's the man who taught me Greek and Hebrew, was Bill Wright. And uh, pastors a church down in Milton, Florida. And I would ask you to pray for him tonight. Please pray for that dear brother. If you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1. The Bible would not be complete without the book of Revelation. We have to seal it up. We've got to close out the canon of Scripture. And so the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, 66 of them, took almost 2,000 years to write this Bible. Think about that now. Think about starting 2,000 years ago to write a book, and now it's just being completed. This is what you have with Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand, Father. I pray now, Lord, that you'd bless this word from the mouth of this messenger tonight. In the hearing of the hearts of the people, let them have ears to hear and a heart to believe. And may it fall on good ground. Father, the seed is perfect. May it find good ground. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. The book of Revelation was written under the reign of Domitian, Roman emperor. There were ten imperial persecutions against the church of God. First one was under Nero, A.D. 54 to 68 A.D., the second one was under Domitian from 81 A.D. to 96 A.D. The third one under Trajan from 98 A.D. to 178, 117 A.D. And the fourth one under uh, Marcus Aurelius Antonius, A.D. 138 to 180 A.D. The fifth under Severus from A.D. 193 to 211 A.D. The sixth under Maximus from 235 A.D. to 238 A.D. The seventh under Decius from 249 to 251 A.D. The eighth under Valerian from 253 to 260 A.D. The ninth under Aurelian from 274 to 287 uh, A.D. And then the tenth under Diocletian from 292 to 304 A.D. And then Constantine shows up. Constantine was a Roman emperor. Constantine abolished the persecution of the church, embraced the Christian faith, and uh, instituted, uh, I guess what you might call, a marriage of church and state. Whether Constantine was a real Christian or not is, is of great controversy to this very day. That's between him and God. He did wait until he was practically on his deathbed before he was baptized because he felt baptism was essential for his salvation. And so Constantine in 325 A.D. Uh, convened the Council of uh, Nicaea and there to establish and ordain what men and women are supposed to believe about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Council of Nicaea was a turning point. Because it was there that the official, uh, you might say, the birth of the Roman Catholic Church as it, relates to the, uh, as, it, as it relates to the government was born and recognized at the Council of Nicaea. So we have ten imperial persecutions. Under Domitian, they took John the Apostle, John the Apostle, they put him in a container of oil and they boiled him alive. They boiled him alive. So, of course, they were going to do away with this man. But the bottom line is, the next day they came out and found him gone. And John the Apostle was finally exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And there on the Isle of Patmos, he wrote the book you're reading right now, the book of Revelation. Now, what I gave you is tradition. It's not Bible history, but there's an awful lot of tradition that no doubt uh, uh, coincides with the Scripture. So whether John the Apostle was baptized, was, was John the Apostle was uh, was uh, boiled in oil, we don't know for certain. But I do know this: 
I do know that when we went to Patmos, they took us to the church. There's a church built there. And they showed us the very spot where the Apostle John was supposed to have been boiled in oil. And he survived that. God miraculously uh, delivered him from the oil. And he went on to write the book of Revelation. Now God wanted the scripture written. And John the Apostle uh, wrote it. And he was the last of the living of the apostles. He outlived all of them. John, of course, was prophesied that he would do that. That he would live until he saw the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed he did. For when he wrote the book of Revelation, the Apostle John was caught up into the third heaven. And he saw things that he recorded for you as he saw them. And as he witnessed them with his own eyes, he said, And I saw, and I saw, and I saw. So the last prophet in the Bible wrote the last prophet, book of prophecy of the Bible. And that book of prophecy was as John the Apostle saw it. Now don't get him mixed up with John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, a, was the pre-runner, the forerunner of Christ. John the Apostle was one of the twelve. And he was the one who stood at the cross of Jesus. And the Lord Jesus looked down and told his mother Mary, Behold thy son. And the apostle John took her that day to his own house and became son to his mother and took care of her the rest of his life. So the apostle John writes the apocalypsis because that's what the revelation, the book of revelation, the word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. And it's a remarkable book because it is, well, as I said before without repeating myself, it is the book that consummates or closes up the canon of scripture. Now, a lot of junk showed up afterward, all kinds of Gnostic gospels, gospels and pseudepigraphic writings and apocryphal books and this and that and so forth and so on. But the scripture closes with revelation. Amen. There are 66 books of holy writ. And we stick to these books of the Bible and no more. If you find something outside scripture that agrees with scripture, good for it. But the authority is this book right here. Amen. Amen. So the book of Revelation is a book that completes, closes up, and seals the revelation of God into the future. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is prominent in the book of Revelation, as He should be. The church is going through great tribulation when the book of Revelation was being written. It was, they were being persecuted. They, as I said to you a moment ago, the church had endured ten imperial persecutions or was in the process of enduring a ten imperial persecutions. They love to take Christians and question them. They like to take them and compare them with their pagan gods. Domitian was a pagan. He had pagan gods. He he worshipped the goddess. He also revived the old Roman religion. He had Vestal Virgins, Pontifus Maximus. He had all of the titles that go along with the Roman religion. And so now on one hand you have Christ, and on the other hand you have Rome. And the two of them clash, and guess who wins? <laughs> The Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation is called the Alpha and the Omega, which means that He encompasses all time. He's called the Living One, which means that He is the personification of life itself. He's called Almighty God, Revelation 1.8. That means He's the Creator. He's called the Ancient of Days because He's the Judge of all mankind. All judgment has been given to Him. He's called the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation because He is the supreme sacrifice. By His blood we are saved and sealed and washed. He's called the Lion of Judah, which identifies him with Israel, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The word Judah means praise, and praise be the blessed one. He's also called the Root of David. This qualifies him to sit on the throne of Israel. For the kingdom of David is a perpetual, everlasting kingdom that will see no end. He's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So therefore the book of Revelation exalts, magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me say this, nothing has any identity. It has no validity. It has no power. It has no message. And it has no meaning if the Lord Jesus Christ is not right smack in the middle of it. Everything revolves around Him. He's what it's about. It's what it's always been about. And what it always will be about. The Son of the living God. I'm glad I know Him tonight with all of my soul. I know whom I have believed. Nobody has to tell me who He is. The Holy Ghost has already sealed Him in my heart and in my soul. The book of Revelation complements the book of Genesis because the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. And the book of Revelation complements that book for it 
has a counterpart to what starts in Genesis. For example, the blood of Abel starts in the book of Genesis. Innocent blood shed by the hand of his brother Cain. And in the book of Revelation, it's the blood of Christ. The final gift. Abel is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Blood is a very important entity in the book of Revelation. For in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 5, it says it washes us from our sins in His own precious blood. If your Bible does not say wash from your sins, throw it away and get you a real Bible. For the new Bible say loosed us from our sins. Loosed, my friend. That's garbage. He washed you from your sins in His own precious blood. The book of Revelation says that we are overcomers. By the blood of Christ, Revelation chapter number 12 and verse 11. Why are we overcomers by the blood of Christ? What can challenge the authority of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Every demon of hell out here in this world, every evil spirit, all sorcerers, all witches, it doesn't matter who they are, they will yield to the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, once spoken by a true believer in the Son of God. In the book of Revelation chapter number 5 and verse number 9, the Bible said He hath redeemed us from our sins in His own precious blood. The blood is necessary for redemption. Bought us back to Himself. Self. And why? How? Not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. So the book of Revelation complements and closes out Genesis. The first Adam is mentioned in the book of Genesis and the last Adam in the book of Revelation. The first Adam brought death. The last Adam brings us life. The first book of the Bible talks about salvation. When Abraham took his son Isaac to Moriah. And there offered him up as a sacrifice unto God. But the book of Revelation chapter number 12 verse 10 said, Now is come salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ is salvation. Some folks are doing their best. They're joining churches. They're being baptized. They're working. They're going through catechisms and this and that and so forth. But friend, salvation is a person. If you have that person, you are saved. To believe on Christ and to know Him right is to know Him in salvation. Say it again. To know God rightly is to be saved. You cannot know Him rightly without being born again. And you cannot know Him rightly without the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything, folks. It's not about me. It's about Christ. So salvation starts in Genesis and is complete in the book of Revelation. In the book of Genesis chapter number 1, the, when God created the heaven and the earth, it says. So the earth begins in the book of Genesis. In the book of Revelation chapter number 21 verse 1, there is a new heaven and a new earth. This new earth is going to replace this floating graveyard in the sky. My, what a death camp you're on. But the Bible says that this earth is going to be done away with. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat and there will be a new heaven and I can't wait to see it. Amen. A new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Glory to God. Just think that Almighty God and Son, the Trinity, my friend, the Godhead is there in the presence of men and ever far as far as you look, my friend, there are no graveyards, no sickness, no death. It's former things. It's all passed away. So there's a new earth. In the book of Revelation, uh, chapter number 20, in the, in the Genesis book, there is a creation. When God creates, Barashith bara, to bring into existence, He creates in the book of Genesis. But in the book of Revelation, there is a new creation. The former things are passed away. The old world is gone. So if you're spending all your time to try to fancy up this world, and you're, an, you're a tree hugger, and, you, and, you, and you're worried about the warming and all this junk, I want to tell you something. It's going to burn, folks. I'm sorry. Everything that you put your stock in trade, it's going up. I'm looking for a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. 
The Bible teaches us here in the book of Revelation, chapters number 1 through chapters number 22, as we read this, there is no book in the Bible that has such a sweeping panorama that encompasses all of time like the book of Revelation does. Revelation is vast in its scope, for it goes all the way back to the beginning and the creation, and it goes into eternity future. And we, little creatures, little ants walking around on this little accursed globe, we fit in here somewhere. I show up over here. I'm going to be here. Let me tell you about my home. Amen? Sweeping scope. Nothing like it. Mankind is frail, fragile, temporal, sinful, and rebellious. Amen. How many agree with that tonight? It's what we are. We are by nature children of wrath. But in the book of Revelation, we are transformed into servants of God. The Bible says we're going to see His face, chapter 22, verse 4. We're going to have His name in our foreheads, chapter 22, verse 4. And then it says in 21, 3, The tabernacle of God is with men, and God shall be with them. Can you imagine? To live through eternity, and there's God. He'll always be there. You'll have access to Him like you've never had. He's God. There's God. There's God. And you'll know where He is. You'll know who He is. And you'll forever shout and glorify God for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Revelation 21 verse number 5 says this, Behold, I make all things new. (laughs) I like that. I love that. I make all things new. Glory to God for the new. Aren't you glad? Have you lived long enough into this in this world to realize in your spirit that it's dying? How many got that tonight? Have you have you lived long enough in this world to understand that I don't care how hard you work at it, how much you put into it, how much you put into building it, it's all going to decay. It is constantly decay. They call it entropy. We have entropy in a closed system. It's one of those things that science cannot change. How in the world could Darwin ever cough up that garbage about about natural selection when the law of entropy says it's dying, it's going down, it's decaying, and it is, folks. Go buy a house after it's been sitting there for 150 years. Look at a man after he's lived 150. Met anybody lately like that? Look at it. Think about it. Look what you look like at 70. I look in the mirror every day and I think to myself, I've got one of those interesting faces. When I look in the mirror, it's interesting. And then I look at it and I say, I've got one of those faces that grab you. (laughs) Yeah, it grabs you. And then once once it grabs you, you won't forget about it. Amen. So I've got an interesting face that grabs you. Well, it took me 71 years to get this face. I'm proud of it, amen? (laughs) I can't imagine if I live another 20 years what I'm going to look like. But I thank God for His goodness. God's been good to me, amen? He's been good to me. So the Bible teaches me that beauty is vain. But the beauty of the soul is not vain. The beauty of the in my, inside of a man or a woman that's born again, that's called the beauty of holiness. And that beauty of holiness separates us from the animal creation. Man walks on a higher plane than a dog. Man understands things that an animal will never understand. Man has a connection and a relationship with God that creation cannot have. Why? Because God made you special with privilege. He made you in His image. Amen. So the Bible tells me that in the book of Revelation... Chapters number 1, 2, and 3, it's the introduction to the book. The fourth and fifth chapter of the book of Revelation is a scene in heaven. It prepares you for what follows in the great tribulation in the next few chapters. And then when you get to the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, say chapter 12, you have a war in heaven. This war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the devil is a prelude, is a, is, is a preparation for what comes down to the earth in chapter 13. For in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, the Antichrist shows up. And folks, he's ready to show up. He's here. Amen. In my Sunday school class this morning, I got into the into the business of, of external wounds or or mechanical wounds or artificial wounds where they can 
they can, they can, I hate to use the create because man can't create anything, but they can, they can take God's creation, put it in that womb, and they can raise a baby. A baby can be born without ever, ever having being in the womb of a, of a woman. Imagine being born in an artificial environment like that and you don't have a mother. Imagine being born like that and you don't have a navel. They're even talking about now putting human embryos in pigs in their wombs and when they carry it for third trimester full term that that baby's mother is a pig what are they doing they're doing all this so they can raise body parts to sell them on the market there's a big market out there for 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 a kidney for a liver for a heart these things bring big bucks and believe me if there is a market for it and i don't care what it is i want to say it clearly tonight If there is a market for it, there will be somebody selling it. Amen. And they'll sell their soul to do that. So Revelation chapter number 13 talks about the Antichrist. 14, we have 144,000 male Jewish virgins show up in chapter 7 and then show up in chapter 14 in heaven. Tells you that God focuses now on Israel. During that seven years of Jacob's trouble, the focus is not on the church. Don't let anybody run the ram the church into the tribulation. Church is gone. But the Jew is prominent now for seven years in the tribulation period. Then we come down to the 17th and 18th chapter of Revelation. And the whore, the religious whore, finally gets her due. And comes face to face with her maker. Then in chapter number 19, one of the most wonderful chapters in all the Bible. He said, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he did judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses. That's me. You don't know how to ride a horse, you'll learn fast. Chapter 19, verse 13. The Bible said he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He comes in power and glory straight into the kingdom of the Antichrist. And he comes to, my friend, to make war. And the scripture says that blood will flow as high as a horse's bridle when the Son of God comes back to this world, not on a cross, not bleeding and dying, but as a man of war and he's coming again and he's going to take what rightfully belongs to him when I told you about the scope of revelation I want you to understand I'm talking about a vast scope for in revelation chapter number 20 it talks about a thousand year reign of Christ it talks about the beast and the antichrist the antichrist and Satan being cast into a bottomless pit for a thousand years Then after that, the great white throne judgment, it all are judged and brought before the Lord Jesus. And then in chapter number 21, a new heaven and a new earth. I'm glad for a new heaven and a new earth. Don't get comfortable with this place. This is not our home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. A bishop by the river. One day I know whom I have believed. And I know that my home is in heaven. We sang about it tonight and I know whom I have believed. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Well, you think you're good enough? No, I'm not good enough. I'm good enough to go to hell. That's all I am. But because of what Christ did, my Savior will keep me out of the pit. Amen. Taking hold of Him. I've cast my soul into His hands. I believe on what He did. And I receive Him as my Savior. With everything in my soul, I embrace the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Do you do that? I didn't ask you to embrace the Baptist church. I didn't ask you to follow me. I said, I said embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. How can it be any plainer? Well, my church teaches, I don't care what your church teaches. Christ is the end of the law for all that believe. The Lord Jesus Christ is our justification, our righteousness, our redemption, our Savior, our salvation. His blood covers my sins and washes it away. Oh, yes. Oh, one day we're going to see Him. One day we'll stand with the millions. One day we'll sing glory to God in the highest. 
we'll sing praises to the Lamb of God. And I look forward to that day because there's something inside my soul that's ready to sing. God could just give me a voice to sing. I'd have it made, wouldn't I? Amen. We're going to sing, folks. Say, I don't like to sing. You better get ready because you're going to be doing some singing. The Revelation talks about them singing. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. I remember about 35 or 40 years ago. I think he was a, I forget now. I think he was, I think he was a, um, what do they call that church? He, he was uh, he, the, 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 the um, Nazarene. He was a Nazarene. He's a Nazarene evangelist. And they put out a, they put out a vinyl, 33 and a third vinyl, Flight Final. How many of you remember that? Flight Final. If you can ever get that, play it. Flight Final. I can't remember that brother's name, but man, did he do a job. I'm telling you right now, he did a job. He talked about him as they, as they approached heaven and as they got on, as they, as they came into the, into the land, the land of the heavenly land of milk and honey. A land where there's no death and dying and sorrow. And to hear him talk about it, and they, and they, and they, and they put the music with it. And he talks about him coming in and they're singing with the redeemed. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. These are mine, the son says to the father. These are the ones he gave me, the son says to the father. The son says to the father, I haven't lost a one of them. Every one of them are mine. And he looks into the faces of the thieves and the liars and the murderers and the muggers and the prostitutes and the religious and the lost. And he says, these are mine for I died for them. For all mine. And he glorifies the Father. And the Father is glorified by the Son. And the Son is glorified by the Father. The reciprocal glorification of Father and Son. The Father glorified Himself through the Son. The Son glorified Himself through the Father. While He was here on this earth. If you glorify the Father, you glorify the Son. You glorify the Son, you glorify the Father. You cannot extricate them. They are inseparably joined together. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the Godhead. One day these mortal eyes will gaze upon the Godhead. And God will dwell with man. He will dwell in our midst. And we shall see Him. And we shall see Him as He is. And we'll walk on streets of pure transparent gold. We'll walk through gates of pearl. We'll look at walls of jasper. Mansions of glory. The saints of God gathered together for eternity and forever and ever and ever and ever. And you might look at each other and you might say, this is too good. It's got to come to an end. Something this good cannot last forever. And that soul looks back and says, but it's good. But it will. It is forever. It is forever and ever and ever. You'll never carry a loved one's body to the graveyard again. You'll never stand in a hospital room and watch some dear soul pass from this world. You'll never see another baby body, little baby's body, little blue body, lying on its mother's chest. You'll never hear those words. You'll never hear them again. I'm sorry, you've got cancer. You don't have much time to live. You'll never hear the words again. They kick your door down and they kill your wife or your husband or your children. You'll never hear or see that again say preacher how could something like that be true that's such a dream world that's the world of the book of revelation i saw the holy city new jerusalem coming down from god out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband 1500 miles that way 1,500 miles that way, and 1,500 miles this. In other words, a perfect cube. 1,500 miles. In Sunday school this morning, I said, the human body, they say, has about 37 trillion cells. Some say more, some say less. Now wrap your mind around what I'm about to say to you. 37 trillion trillion cells in a human body. There are seven billion, with a B, people alive right now walking on this earth. So if you multiply seven billion times 37 trillion, that's how many cells are actively alive communicating in in the bodies of the people alive. Right? Am I right? 
We got 37 trillion cells, one body. We got 7 billion bodies. 7 billion times 37 trillion. I don't think there are that many suns, stars, planets in the universe. Amen. What do you mean, preacher? I mean to say to you that a human being has a universe within them. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you do. 37 trillion cells. Not all of them, but a lot of them have a nucleus. Inside that nucleus is DNA. Those cells are replicating, communicating through RNA. Through, through, through some of the most complex ways that you can imagine. They're communicating. Chromosomes. Comes from the Greek word chroma and psalm. It means colored body. Most of them are X. They're colored. But a few Ys show up. When the Y shows up, we got a male. We get 23 sets of chromosomes. We get 23 from our mom. 23 from our dad. Gives us 46 chromosomes. A chromosome is made up of billions of these DNA cells. Genetic structure communicating. Man, all of this going on inside my body right now. Get to think, boy, I wonder what's doing what, what, what? When what said what? Man, I didn't hear a thing about it, but all this is happening. Yeah, it is. You are more alive than you could ever imagine. And yet, God's going to take that body. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. And make you a new body. Amen. When dwelleth righteousness. A glorified body. 1 Corinthians 15. Sown in dishonor, raised in honor. Sown terrestrial, raised celestial. Amen. Sown weak, raised in power. 1 Corinthians 15. We have an earthly body. We'll have a heavenly body. We'll have an eternal body. And that body, I don't think, will have chromosomes, genes, DNA. It'll be a body like His glorious body. A spiritual body of power for eternity. So now I'm, I'm living in a body. In heaven, it'll never get old. It'll never bleed. It'll never suffer. It'll never die. Won't have a face that grabs you. I'll have something that's socially acceptable. <laughs> never, ever, ever worry about dying. For now you have eternal life. And that life is in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life. As long as you are connected with Him, you'll live forever. And nobody can sever you from the Son of God. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you bless your word tonight. Thank you for another opportunity to stand tonight and proclaim the truth. My Father, we love our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless His righteous name. Exalt Him and exalt Him forever. Without Him, this is all just insanity. With Him, it all makes sense because He pulls together what the mind cannot comprehend. It's all in Christ. For in Jesus' name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Amen.